Thank you so much for the invitation. It is likely that I'll run over, so I'm just going to jump right in without a lot of introduction. But I want you to help me. And uh, what do I need to do? Nothing. I need to fix something up here. Connection problems? Yeah, we'll, we'll get it going. That's okay. My title is Equip the Shepherd in the 21st Century. And there is a, oh, there it is. And there's a subtitle, which is, I'm going to keep talking, an elder's work in the kingdom. And I want to emphasize that idea of an elder's work. When we have our thoughts about elders, what's the, where are the primary passages we go to first? Where would you go? We're talking about elders tonight. Where are you going to go? First Timothy 3 and Titus 1. And what would you find if you open those texts up? What would you find there? Qualification. Is that the same as the work? It really isn't. In fact, if you look at them, it just they're gentle. Well, that's good, but that's not what they do. They just don't play around being gentle, right? And actually, a good propor proportion of those qualifications are what they're not. You ever thought about that? They're not greedy, filthy lucre. They're not quick-tempered, right? They're no brawler, no striker. They're not giving too much wine. They're blame. Less, right? So that doesn't help you much to know what do they actually do. What I'd like to do tonight is not so much talk about how to be qualified to be an elder or how to stay qualified or how to be more qualified if you are one. I'd like to think about the work that elders do. Where would I find that? So I have an assignment. I don't need the fancy overhead to do this. I want you right now to make a mental picture. Think of an elder. How many of you have seen an elder before? <laughs> Everybody seen one? All right. Think of one you've seen. Picture him. Picture him actually doing an elder thing. You know what I mean? There he is. He's an elder. He's eldery. Her. You got it? First impression. I'm not one of the best in it. Just what, what's the first picture that comes to your mind? I want you to share that with me, if you will. Right? And I'd like some from younger folk and older folk and men and women, if you did get that, right? All right, so tell me your, and I'm, I'm not judging these things, right? What, what's your picture of a man, an elder, he's doing an elder, where is he? He's where? Okay, that's a quality, but where is he? Uh, you took a photograph. He's serving his But where is he? I'm going to get a specific picture. I'm sorry I'm arguing with you, but what? He's oh, I got that. He's older. That's a qualification. He's among, among the congregation. He's where? Among the congregation. All right. So there are people all around. I was going to ask these questions. So here's my Small version. Okay. okay. Same way. No problem. Um, so did you see that flash go off there? No. All right. Where is the man physically? Where is he standing, sitting? Where, where is he? In your, your, now remember, you took the picture yourself. You didn't. Don't change it. It's a picture. It's a photograph. Where was it? Yes. Where is he standing? Yeah. He's he's yeah. Okay. He might be standing right here, right? Would an elder stand right here? Right? And what would he be saying? Say again. He may not be saying anything. That's true. He might not. But in your picture, what was he doing? He was elder. Remember? That was qualification. Yes. Sitting in a Bible study at somebody's house. All right. He's at somebody's house. He's sitting and he's talking to... And that's my question. Who else is there? So there's some Christian there. You know, New right? couple or... All right. Good. That's good. What else? Give me another picture that you had. Counseling. He's counseling. Maybe one person, maybe more than one. Maybe it's a couple. Maybe it's a family. Right? So he, where is he? He's in somebody's home. Well, those imaginations are not very precise. You know, I'm just... I hate to complain about that. My image is uh, in a bowling alley because that was my first interaction First time you met an elder. Like I knew he was an elder. He was. Yeah. He had me join their bowling team. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They had four elders on the team, and one of them couldn't play with them that uh, yeah. season. And they said we need someone to be the okay. fourth. And they, so, so elders are bowlers. Is that the yeah, that's what they were doing. That's what they were doing. elders were bowling. That's their. That's right. Okay. It's just regular. Okay. Okay. I'm saying these are all qualifications. I'm trying to picture. Y'all see what we talked about? I'm not going to talk about qualifications tonight. Yes, I know they have to be older, and I know they have to be gentle, and I know they have to be consistent in their life. That's what you are qualified to do. What? We're examples to the flock. Okay. They're, they're an example, but you know, that means they just do everything the flock does. 
But there's something unique about what elders do. I'm, I'm, I'm intentionally being difficult, so I apologize for that. I'm not trying to be troublesome. Can you better, the guardian of the souls that they Yeah. They're in charge of it. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, to me, that's a huge responsibility. All right. Follow an example of Christ. Okay, they are doing that, yes. Um, they go the wrong direction. I'm still doing it. All right. So, um, I was going to ask this question finally. There was the flash went off. Here's your picture. Uh, and so, what does submission to the elder look like? And I don't necessarily want you to answer that out loud, but what you have told me that an elder does, and I've heard some things about counseling. I think that's the most specific picture we have, maybe. Uh, bowling, I guess, is more specific than that, right? Are we to submit to elders? Is that a, is that a scriptural concept? We're going to talk about that. Yes. If it is, then whatever picture you have in your mind, it's probably, I hope, will be more than just one, right? of what elders do, that's the context in which submission ought to be considered, don't you think? If that's the word. Right? We're, we're, submit, we're to submit to each other. That's true, but is there some special sense in which elders rule, have authority? So this is my, part of my challenge. I'm going to talk about this in just a minute. So. They're the shepherd until the good shepherd. Until, yes, that's right. Yes? Yeah, they have to be a, a man. Yes, all that. That's right. Qualifications. All right. All right, so here's my outline for tonight. I'm sorry. We're going to keep watching that flesh thing over and over. Uh, I want to talk about the work of an elder. It's not really, I think I'll make two references to Titus 1, 1 Timothy 3. That's really not where what elders do is described. I'll tell you where it is. The examples are found in the book of Acts, several places through the book of Acts, where the money was laid to the elders' feet. Agabus, Agabus is prophecy, right? Or the letter was sent in Acts 15 to explain the church in Antioch. What is our findings here? They picked men, they sent the letter, they decided to send the letter. Other things. Interesting that one of the, other, one of the actions of elders described, I think it's in chapter 19, where Paul the apostle shows up in Jerusalem and the elder meets him at the front door and says, wait, we don't want you to come in until you take some actions because there's some rumors about you that will split the church if we don't be careful about how you approach the church. Remember that incident? Isn't it strange that an elder is confronting the Apostle Paul? Well, why? Well, he's protecting the flock. You see that? So those are things that elders do. So examples from the book of Acts, but also teaching. There's teaching, and there's several chapters which will have a verse or two and kind of informative teaching about commands. Now, not examples, but commands about what elders' work is. And four of them are in chapter 5 of the book. 1 Peter 5, you're probably aware of that. 1 Thessalonians 5, a verse or two we'll look at there. 1 Timothy 5, elders rule well, double honor. And what's the other one? Um, well, of course, you can't remember, but there's four of them that have chapter 5 in it. I'll, I'll think of it, and we'll get to it, and use it, and then I'll know what it is. And then there's Ephesians 4 and Acts 20, when Paul met with the Ephesian elders, are key uh, verses that have to do with the, the work that it James 5, thank you. I remember. Right? The elders go visit men who's sick or anything like that. So that's James 5. Okay. So here we are. And then I'll uh, talk about submission at the end. The work of an elder. And, and I just, just to keep you kind of a, a little bit more comforted, oh, uh, just to keep you more comforted, I'm going to spend most of my time on the work of the elder and less on all the others. So if it's a long time and I've only gotten through the first point, you don't need to panic. Maybe we'll take a bathroom break. I don't know, but we'll, we'll try to get there. All right, I'm going to divide the work that an elder does into two kinds of work. In the overlap, I'm not trying to say that everything they do is one side or the other, and there's no inter, inter, uh, intersection between the two. In fact, I'm going to exactly tell you what the intersection is. I'm going to call the first kind of work that an elder does flock shepherd. And I was hoping that when you said, oh, here's what I, I, I pictured an elder, and he's up in front of the church, and you say, you know, because of COVID, we're going to have to, we'll all wear masks. Or we're going to, you know, go home and we'll watch each other on Zoom. Or whatever, you know, those kind of hard decisions. Making corporate decisions for the church. You know what I mean? As an elder. And, that's, and we're going to study the book of Ephesians. 
for the rest of the year. And then we're going to invite this preacher to come. You'll, you'll see. You see, the, the thing about that decision is kind of a corporate decision that affects the whole flock. Right? Now, are they thinking about individuals and individual things? Of course they are. But it is a decision that's made for the whole flock. Acts 15 is that example. Here's a letter. We write this letter. We send it down to the church in Antioch because we now know uh, that the Gentiles don't need to obey the old law. We say, y'all get what I'm saying there? So, so a definition. I hope I swipe the right way. Yeah. And so the other side, and I'm sorry, this is just the terminology that some of us have used to teach, is called sheep shepherding. What's there between sheep and a flock? How many you got? Yeah, how many? That's it, yeah. Sheep is one, flock is many. Flock's a singular noun, but it's a collective noun. It means it's a collection of things, actually. Sheep. Well, I collect nouns. Church is a singular noun, right? But it's really collective. Church is a body of people, right? You see. Are there things that elders do that affect just individual sheep? Well, okay. Yeah, for sure. And we'll look at that. And we'll like, I wonder which of these two occupies the most of their time. Which is the most important? Which is the most difficult? Which is the most uh, mentally and emotionally draining? Which requires the most experience? Which of these are the qualifications that we're not going to talk about tonight most are most relevant? You just think about that. Flock shepherding or sheep shepherding. And so that, of course, has to do with pre protecting and developing individual Christians by doing all these things. Watching, warning, advising, teaching, exhorting, rebuking. So, I'm sure it isn't the case here. No, I suspect it is. But our view, view of, Christ, of uh, elders is probably primarily which of these two? Flock. Why do you say that? Well, they're both of their duties, right? But, know, but in general, they have to. I don't know what I'm trying to say. I, I know what I'm trying to say. I can't spit it out. Yeah. I just, I yeah. just. I think unless you're directly. He's going to help you. Unless you're directly the sheep, I think you don't see the individual sheep hurting, but you can always kind of. There see you go. There's one real good reason. Which is the most visible, right? Do you even know if an elder is working with a couple that's struggling with their marriage or somebody, some young kid that's got an addiction problem? Do you even know that that's going on <coughs> this year in the residency? Unless they ask for prayers. Okay, but there may be some reason it becomes public. But you know, the more private it is, the more likely it is to be resolved with the least amount of turmoil and other things like that. So that's one thing. One's more visible than the other, right? I think it's also true I, that elders don't do very much of the same. And I, that's part of what I'm here to preach about tonight. I think that if you think about it, the first thing elders worry about is, well, when we don't meet, and the finances, and what's happening to the crowds, and you know, what are we going to do about COVID, and all that. And we kind of tend to think about elders and judge elders, especially if we're less mature about what that elders are actually doing. And we think, oh, they're making bad decisions. They chose a bad preacher. I can't believe we're studying this kind of thing. Why don't they fix the pavement in the parking lot so we don't have potholes everywhere? You see, these are collective decisions, and that's kind of what we, I didn't think we worry about that when we go to point out, right? I'm going to lose my power over the group. I'm going to lose my say, my voice, my representation, right? Where I had a men's meeting, everybody got to say, now these guys are going to get in the closet, and they're going to make a decision that will be a disaster. I'm sure no one here would say that, but you know what I'm getting at here. We kind of judge the men as if they were corporate leaders somehow or another. Are you smiling? <laughs> I hope you're smiling. <laughs> okay, so, but anyway, y'all know what I'm getting at here. Look at these two tasks, and I'm going to preview a little what I'm going to say. Which of these are the most important for saving souls? Both have a role. So if you had to pick, the chief shepherd. What is the first, what is, what is Jesus the good shepherd do when there's 99 collective, you know, sheep in the fold? They're doing fine. What does he do? He goes for the one. Thank you. And you know when that one repents, guess what? There's more joy in heaven than that 99 that had a big parking lot. Right? That were okay. Okay, I'm exaggerating, but okay. You know, go with me here. 
Do elders rule? Is it fair to say they have authority? They're in a position, really, of having some authority that people need to live. <coughs> look at these passages, and you see how many of my five, chapter five, there are. And then there's the lucky chapter, Hebrews 13. This will help you remember. But yes, they rule. And by the way, the rule word, there's a couple of different Greek words here. But the one in Hebrews 13, twice there, 7 and 17, I think, um, is a Greek word, hegeomai, from which we get the word hegemony. And it's the word that Stephen used to describe Joseph being the ruler in Egypt. Remember that story in the Old Testament? Stephen references that and uses the Greek term, you know, Joseph was made a ruler, same word, as it's found in Hebrews 13. So these are passages that suggest there is rule. I've tried to put it in a cool blue so nobody gets too upset about this. But it is true. It is a word that's used that suggests authority. Let's look closer at them, though. So the first thing is there's rule. But secondly, what is the focus of that rule? Let the elders who rule well be counted of worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you'll not muzzle the ox while it treads out the grain, the laborer is worthy. So I just, I just as a side point, want to tell you, we start to worry about authority, especially in America, right? We just don't like bosses. The idea is to have your own business and nobody, I don't have to report to anybody. And you really don't trust those guys up the corporate ladder anyway. You know, IQ is inversely proportioned to your position in the organization. It's pretty clear. We don't like the idea of a hierarchy of somebody telling us what to do. So we kind of reject it. But look closely at this passage. There's an image of an ox treading out grain and a laborer in the field who's been hired to do manual labor. Which of these is the elder? The guy who's beating the ox around or the ox himself? The laborer who's being paid or the man who hires the laborer? In this image, which is the elder? The man who hired. It's the laborer is worthy of his hire. In the context of passages, you can support it, number, right? Because he's working. You see, the ox or the man who's whipping the ox around. In this image, in this metaphor, he's the ox. He's the ox. Pretty clear. He's borrowing from the Old Testament imagery to say, you know, God works like this. That's the way an elder is pictured. It's the laborer. An ox who's treading out the grain. Not some kind of key. And yet, there's a rule. It says in this very verse that he's ruling. But the primary piece of that rule has to do with the word and doctrine, which means teaching, right? It means that his work, his rule, is implemented through the word of God by showing people what truth is, what they should be doing, how they could be obeying uh, the word itself. Similarly, uh, Hebrews 13, 7, remember those who rule over you. American Standard suggests a past tense to that, who had to rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you. You see that? That's how you remember them. What do you remember about those former elders? Maybe they died. They've passed on. Right? They're not around anymore. What do you remember about them? They taught me the word. Not only that, but you mentioned a good example. Somebody said that. Uh, guess what? I'm also remembering their personhood and remember that they had a faith that I wanted to follow. I wanted to imitate. I wanted to be like them. And so a special thing about elders, and I believe deacons too, it's not so much that their work really can't be done by anybody else. I don't think that's the primary thing. But they say it is representative of Christ when they do that in his church. And the reproach on the church when a man who's been appointed a deacon meeting the qualifications or an elder who's meeting these qualifications is much higher, isn't it, when they see him. And therefore, verse Timothy 5, rebuke in the sight of all that all may be in fear. We can't have a person who is represented in an appointed office, uh, a representative of Christ and the Word, who sin, you see, it's a much more serious thing. And so, when they're gone, what do I remember? They taught me the Word, mainly, that's what they were doing. But secondly, their life turned out good, right, all the way to the end. That's what I'm remembering about them. Okay, that's, that's the kind of rule it is. We'll say more about rule in just a minute. Paul went to uh, Ephesus, he was there for like three years, traveled all around, he was in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem with the gift. You remember he, he sent ahead to the Ephesian elders, had them meet him in, in Miletus. I think so he could not miss his ship that he was riding on, right? And be there on that seaport coast. The elders of Ephesus, which is, by the way, where Timothy was later working, where those qualifications are listed for Timothy. Met Paul there in Miletus, and 
He starts reminding them, and you can look in verse 18. He says, remember when I was with you, I did this. In verse 31 is an implication there. Remember how I did this. And in verse 35, he says, I've shown you in every way, or in all things I gave you an example, American Standard, by laboring like this. Why is Paul pointing to his own personal example to these elders? They're the elders of the church of Ephesus. I think there were 12. I have no basis for that. But I think they had quite a few. There's a group of men. Why is he pointing to his own history among the church of Ephesus? Yes, that's exactly right. He said that those very words on another occasion. But in particular, in your roles as elders, I think you need to look at what I did when I was among them. Well, what did Paul do when he was among them? And now, I think we're getting to a job description. You know, I said before, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 doesn't say much about what elders do. This does. Paul said, you want to know what you're supposed to do as an elder? I was with you for three years. Do what I do. And here's what he said he did. He said, I proclaimed everything helpful. Again, emphasis on teaching, right? That was needed. Not just uh, what you needed to know in that moment. I declared the whole counsel of God. I took heed to myself, my weaknesses, my example, and also took heed to the flock. Looking for, learning, watching out for the flock. I'm not reading this text, but just read it and look at all the things. It's, it's just it's a job description. I mean, it's, it's no, no less than that. Uh, he said, I protected you from external threats. These are the wolves that will come in and destroy the sheep. Or I want you to protect from internal threats. He says, from among your own number, men will arise speaking perverse things. Got to watch for that. Certainly, if it's from among the elders themselves, also from the flock itself. That's got to be watched for. Watch and warn night and day. I provided for my own needs and for the needs of others. That's spectacular work, Paul. Right? You might think he supported himself as a preacher. No, he did more than that. He supported himself and others. Busy man. He uh, supported the weak. It's better to give than receive. And here's the passage on that. I didn't put the whole thing up, verse 35, at the top, but here it is at the bottom. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the rich people in the church. The family that's been there since the church was founded. The people are in the pew every Sunday. The people that give the most money to keep the treasury balance up. Who will we support? Who will we say we're supporting? And what does that look like? Is that a person that's always here every Sunday? Unfortunately not. Is it a person that's easy to get a hold of sometimes? Or all the time? Is it a person whose life is quite complicated and maybe a lot of ways that are not healthy? Probably so. You see what I'm getting at here. Is it a person who might even be troublesome in the church because of the troubles that they have in their own lives? Is it a person who might be a drain on the resources of the church because of the trouble and problems that they can solve? Is that possible? And what is Paul saying the primary work of these elders is? I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. That's what the church is kind of for. Have you ever thought about that? Why are we here? Just because we like singing together and Bible study? Or are we here to help each other get better? To grow up? We're going to see that in another passage. To overcome our weaknesses. To get over our problems. To lock arms when somebody's stumbling and make sure we can keep moving in. That's what this church is for. It's not just a club. We got to stay, we ought to all keep coming to keep the contribution up so we make the building payments so we can stay here. No. The church has a much grander purpose, which is getting souls to heaven. Do you see that? If that's what the church is about, what do the leaders of the church care most about? And who are they most worried about is the weak. And he actually quotes a the Jesus a passage from Jesus, which is not recorded in the Gospels, but I believe he said it. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus as he said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And sometimes we think that means, well, it's better to give a birthday present than to get a birthday present. No, he's talking about a sacrificial life. It's a much more serious thing. And that's what shepherds are called to do. That's what Paul did. Laboring night and day with tears he adds in the passage, right? 
teaching publicly and from house to house. By the way, that sounds a little bit like flocking sheep shepherding, doesn't it? Publicly and house to house. Speaking of. Okay. Ephesians 4, another key passage, I think, that helps us see at least the relationship between sheep shepherding and flock shepherding. Let's take a look at this passage. Um, I won't go into the context of the passage. The context is, is gifts that are mentioned earlier in the text. But uh, he, Christ, himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets. Do we still have apostles and prophets? Okay, not a lot, but we do we have the gifts that they raise. Yeah, so that's a gift to the church. We still benefit from the apostles and prophets, right? Uh, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, some combine those two words, which is okay with me, because I think pastors are primarily uh, ruling through the word, as I said before. For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, the knowledge of what? Till we all come to the unity of faith and knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. Is that our goal for being together in the church? Is that the purpose for the gifts God gave, including elders or pastors? He uses that term here. That we grow up and that we be unified. Uh, and he says that we should what? No longer be children. Do we want children in the church? And I don't really mean toddlers. We like toddlers too, though, don't we? Yeah, I'm not saying that. But do we want, like, baby Christians in the church? Do we really? But are they, aren't they troublesome? Aren't they often confused? Do they sometimes cry out and get kind of angry when they shouldn't? Get themselves into trouble? Real babies do that too, you know. Your moms know they keep you up all night. Right? And they don't kind of stop and say, well, I didn't realize it was 3 in the morning. Go back to bed. Mom, I can wait. No, they need help right now. A new diet or milk or whatever they need. Well, new, new baby Christians can be troublesome too. Do we really want them in the church? Yeah. They call fall in that category if you must support the weak, I think. Right? Yes, we do, but we do want them to stay babies. Of course not. And he goes on to say, they're tossed to and fro, carried about, they're in they get in all kind of trouble, they're confused easily, they don't know anything, and so on and so on. But look, but what? They should, that we should no longer be children, but what? We may grow up. That's what we're trying to get to. That's what the gifts that God gave the church and the elders are intended to do, is to help us grow up. And the more babies, the better, but even better, let's have them be growing up. Right? That's what we're trying to do. And that's what this text is about. Now, interesting, if you look at this text, um, there's a top part that really, in some ways, describes the collective flock, right? The edifying of the body of Christ, we all come to unity of the faith, the knowledge of Son of God. Unity of the faith has to do with collective people who see things the same way. Don't you, you agree with that? And actually, if you go on down, similar language at the end of that text, for whom the whole body, what's the whole body? What's the body here in Ephesians? The church, yeah. The whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective work, by every part is doing its share, causes growth of the body. And edifying, there's the same word again, building up in love. But notice in the middle, then, you have this idea of individual growth. Children, who were children at first, but they grow up. You see that. Here's another way to kind of diagram that here. There's gifts given for the equipping to do some kind of work. Well, what is that work? It's actually building up the body. Well, how's that done? Everybody becomes more and more into a unity of the faith, right? And at the end of the text, of course, verse 16, I think Jesse or, or somebody, yeah, James was saying, uh, what are those footnotes on there? He thought I had a bibliography or something. Those are the verses out of the text. Okay. Anyway, there they are. But you see they're kind of similar. It begins and ends by saying we're all knit together. We're in unity. Every joint supplying. It's love flowing here and there, right? That's kind of the idea. For what purpose? Well, the purpose is, of course, that we all grow up to be a perfect man. The measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Which is, that's kind of the, and by the way, protected, not children, not tossed, but we also grow up. So in the middle are our individual goals. I want to grow up. I don't be a children anymore. Sorry, a child anymore. I don't want to grow up. But you see then, around that is this cocoon, this family that's full of love. And every joint is helping out. 
in the process of protecting that child from the dangers that they're in and helping them to learn and grow up. You see that. So I ask this very obvious question. What if the body is not unified and there isn't love and every part is not doing its share? Growth stops. Yeah, is that harmful for those babies that we're trying to take care of? Right. Now, zoom out. Elders, are they managing the flock or the sheep? Are they ruling over the flock or the sheep? Both, thank you. Why? So what is their main concern is helping the weak. That's what Paul said. But does that mean that they would think about collecting sheep? Flock shepherding decisions, right? In light of what how it might affect the sheep individually. Well, of course. In fact, who might they think of the most as they make a COVID decision? or a pay the parking lot decision, or a choosing the preacher decision, or some of those collective decisions, who would they be thinking about the most? Probably how can we grow, and especially some of the weak and the babies in the church. That might be their main concern. Now, the point of this text, that I'm, my use of this text, is to show that really you're doing both, but really one's kind of subordinate to the other. I want to have help children become grown men to measure the stature of the fullness of Christ. And I will make collective decisions as an elder that has that in mind. And it may not be the most convenient for somebody else, especially a mature Christian, who in the end has to sacrifice for the weak. According to Romans, we that are strong bear the infirmities. It could be that decisions the elders make are based on the needs of some of the weakest members who you like to say, well, they don't contribute anything. No, they don't. They're here to be contributed to, to grow up. Okay, I hope that's a little different view of the way we think about it. Because I think our first view is, boy, well, those being in the elders, we're going to spend all the money on stupid stuff. I just know it. You know what I mean? We just start worrying about these kind of collective flock shepherding issues. They're hardly even spiritually oriented at all. And that's not the story in the New Testament. Okay, a few other things I would say. And you see where I'm going. I'm quite biased on it. And if you want to argue with me, I'll be, I'll be real passionate about it. But you see what I'm saying? Which is the real work of the elders? Sheep shepherding or flock shepherding? The sheep shepherding. Now, they do both. One is definitely supported to the other. Let me give you some more proofs of that. If there's a passage in Ezekiel 34. You should just read it. I have it marked, but I always run over, so I'm not going to. But it's a picture of the terrible shepherds of Israel who muddied the water and ate the sheep instead of shepherding them, right? And beat them and left them off in the hills lost. That's the metaphor of shepherds. But if you read that text, God says, I'm going to be the shepherd. I'm going to be the right kind of shepherd. And he says, I will search out for my sheep, all lost on the mountain on a, on a what does he say, dark and cloudy day. That's what the shepherd does. That's his first thing he's going to do, is try to find those sheep that are wandering around. I don't know if you in your life have ever been at a place spiritually where you're lost. You may not even know you're lost, right? But you don't know where, you don't know how to get back. Are there Christians that get themselves that place? That's the first thing. Search them out and find them. Second thing, bring them back to safety. Surround them with a place where they're secure, where their fears are allayed, where they're protected from evil influences, where somebody is responsible for what they do each day when they're struggling with maybe a habit or something. You see that? In a safe place. Second, third, feed them. Give them rich food, as opposed to those shepherds who just trampled the food and muddied the water that the sheep would have had to drink. By, probably by their own life example. Can you imagine a struggling Christian who comes back and all they see is hypocrisy and cruelty and prejudice in the church? What's that going to do to their republic? Oh no, they need pure, rich food and clean water. And finally, they're likely to have been broken in some way because of where they've been. Y'all ever know anybody that struggled the rest of their life as a consequence of saying, oh, they're repenting, they're doing their best, but they're just not as healthy as they would have been if they hadn't done that. Y'all know this. Most of us have experienced that in our life. The shepherds heal them. They find ways to help them recover from that. Yes? That's why we have to be patient with each other. Thank you. Yes. Can I stop on that point a little bit? <coughs> that, is this an easy thing to do? Is it going to be done overnight? 
is going to take a lot of time and effort and energy, which sometimes seems pointless and fruitless, and sometimes the sheep themselves don't even like it. And they will kick back and say, I don't like this medicine. Is that possible? That is the metaphor of shepherd. And I, you know, there's shepherding, we think of it as like a big flock and a single shepherd. Okay, that's probably right. But really, the picture of shepherds is quite personal. Jesus uses that to say, you know what? When sheep hear a particular voice, even if they're mixed with other flocks, guess what? They follow. They know the master. And he knows them by name. And I think that was typical of shepherds at the time this was written. I just recognized all sheep would have liked to be. I haven't been around any cows the same way. I haven't felt colors before. But anyway. But the point is, he knows their names. And they follow him. And I'm remembering the story that Nathan told David about that little sheep, you know, that the rich guy took away from that family. That sheep was so precious, he ate at the table with him. Did that have an effect on David, the shepherd? It stabbed his heart. He said, that man's worthy to die, <laughs> right, for taking that sheep. You wouldn't think taking the sheep would be a capital offense. But in David's mind, oh, that closeness was, was, was just too much. And it took me out. Yeah, I was thinking about this also from the perspective of the 99. The man yeah. shepherd goes yeah. out yeah. and finds that lost sheep. The 99, are they going around going, hey, hey where's our shepherd? Like, what are yeah. we supposed to do right now? Does he not care about us? Yeah. Because we all feel that way when someone is taking up the energy and the time. Yeah, exactly. I've shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must help the weak. I, I just think that's what the Bible is teaching. And, and a shepherd, who does he spend most of his time? It's not the sheep that's right in the middle and always goes where he's supposed to go and always eats and healthy and all that. It's the ones that are off in the weeds all the time. That's the way. So the, the metaphor of a shepherd is quite personal. I hope you can see that. Uh, connection lost. You know, the goal of the 99, it should be to um, help the shepherd yes, with that one. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, we're, we're a little bit smarter, usually, than sheep from the standpoint of our awareness of one another. And I believe that passage in Ephesians 4 was saying that, right? What is the, what is the church doing when it's built up and unified? In love, through that which every joint supply. My question is, joints are connections between members. How are your connections with members? And if you had to worry about your connections with some members over others, which ones would you worry about the most? The weak, right? I think that's where this goes. Now, that's a, not a shepherding point, but it certainly is the case. So, what's the primary duty? Well, I'm going to make some more arguments. As if I haven't convinced you yet, I'm going to keep on convincing you, right? First of all, elders, Hebrews 13, 17, Watch on behalf of the soul. <laughs> obey those. There's the other side of rule, by the way. They're not just rule, but they're also to be obeyed. A command. And be submissive, a command. For they watch out for your soul. Are churches saved collectively? Does this church have a soul that's going to be judged? No, no. Elders are watching on behalf of the individual soul. And that's kind of the summary that the Hebrew writer gives there in chapter 13 of what the elders do, those that rule over you. James 5, an individual man with a problem, maybe either sin or sickness or both, maybe related, calls for elders. That's an individual hands-on activity. First Timothy 3, we will talk about the passage just one time, qualifications. What is the reason that the Father is said to, that we want him to, here's the qualification, that he manages his household. Remember that passage? There's a reason given there. That's different from the other qualifications. What's the reason? If he can't rule his household, how can he rule the family? That's right. And say it positively, his work in ruling, managing his household, really is rehearsal, training for ruling the church. So we, when you conclude from that passage, that's what's going on. Now, let me just ask, how do fathers father? Good fathers. If you had a good father, think about that good father. Is he good in your mind, or you can think of another one that is good if you didn't? Is he good because he got the the family lined up and, you know, in the car, in time, on time, rigorously, you know, following all the rules, never creating any problems. Is that what makes a man a good father? Everybody's shaking their head no. 
if you had a good father, was it because of the personal relationship you had with him, or because he managed to flock, you know, real efficient? Which is in fact, the second, without the first, might even actually be harmful. You see that? If all you got was orders and punishment if you didn't do the right thing, but you had no personal relationships, that's a disaster of fatherhood, isn't it? The picture of fatherhood is one in which he rules his house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. But that's a personal thing. It's not a collective thing. In fact, I think about the passage in Hebrews 12 where an earthly father is a contrast to our heavenly father. And what is the purpose of chastening? Right? Either God doing it to us or our fathers that seem best to men for a while, earthly fathers, was for our profit, for our holiness, so that we can be trained in righteousness. Go look at that text. That's what fathers are about. Even in their chastening is to make the children better. That's what they're doing. So I think the image of, of the father, which shows up in the qualifications, even suggests a personal relationship. Here's an interesting passage, 1 Thessalonians 5. We urge you, brethren, to recognize, in other translations, appreciate or acknowledge those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. So the things that they do, see the blue words mean they're over you, authority. The yellow words have to do with the work itself. And admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love because they're the smartest Christians in the whole church. Is that what it says? Because they're labor of the importance of their work. Because they know the Bible better than anybody else. They're like Mary Poppins, practically perfect in every way. No, none of those things. In fact, they're probably imperfect men who are struggling with things as well. Why do we esteem them and follow them and do all these other things? And recognize, appreciate, and so on. Why? Because they have a difficult task because often we don't want to do ourselves. That's part of it. We shouldn't want to, but we don't. But they're charged before the chief shepherd. Right? That's what Hebrews 13, 7 said. They'll give an account. Who shall give an account? He says. So really, let's say an elder is qualified. That doesn't mean he's perfect. It doesn't mean he's judgment, especially in flock shepherding matters. There'll always be the best in some measure of financial or peace or whatever. I still will esteem that man highly, not because of his personal intrinsic qualities, brilliance, charisma, you know, his organizational skills, right, his vision, his creativeness. Are those in the list of qualifications, by the way? I don't think so. Not when I was in class. Because of the work he has to do. That's the thing. We ought to be reverent of what he's doing. Because they watch in behalf of souls. This is a totally different picture I think than we have sometimes. It's a corporate picture of what elders do, like the running a company or something. Look at the context of this passage, actually. The verse before says, comfort each other, edify one another, just as you're also doing. And the verse after says, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted. Are these sheep or are flock shepherd and things that he's describing, both before and after? No, I think she. Individual. Yeah, it's individual. Each one, each other, one another. Warn the unruly, the faint-hearted. Is everybody faint-hearted? Well, not usually, but some are. Weak, right? No one renders evil for anyone. So in the context of that, he sticks in this verse that says, hey, you know, honor the men who are actually specially charged with admonishing you and so on. Okay, I'm still hammering on this point. Uh, that's, we just made that point. And the other thing is, of course, uh, that the mastery of the word mentioned in Titus, this is one reference to the qualification, is to actually convict the gainsayer. I won't spend more time on that, just to say that's an individual effort to stop false teachers who are uh, individually teaching falsely. Paul's example, we talked about before, I don't need to cover that. And I just say there's a general argument that basically says Christians are saved or lost individually. I wish it weren't so. I wish somehow we could just collect everybody in the room. If you had enough righteous people, we'd all make it, right? It just doesn't work that way. We must all stand before the judgment seat of God. We receive the deeds done in the body, Second Corinthians 5. No, it's each one of us. That's an individual battle that we're all in. And I need a coach. I need an individual. That's what, that's what shepherding the flock is. 
Okay. Now, the rest of the lesson. We'll go very quickly. Um, 21st century. I don't know. Philip, my first thought on that was, it's a little late to be thinking about that. Like we're a quarter of the way through the 21st century. But I do think there are some unique challenges that we face. And I wonder if this work of the elders, which I hope you understand a little bit differently, better than you maybe did before. Thinking about that primary concern that a shepherd, an elder, a pastor has. I wonder what the challenges of the 21st century would do to that work, to the need for skills and knowledge to be able to be successful at that. Sheep, sheep shepherding in the 21st century. I don't know. I found this on the internet. Uh, I assume it's, it matches my own experience. Just to kind of just say the purple stuff on the right those are the people from each generation, starting with the you know silent, the greatest generation of World War II, the baby boomers, that's kind of me, uh, right? The Generation X, millennials, we probably have some Gen Zers in the room, don't we? Got all those folks here. And this is not the Lord's Church, but it is religious people generally. And what you notice is the purple over on the right are people who now claim no affiliation with any religion at all. See that? And what has happened to that is more than a third of the population in the United States is in that category. You see that? Now, on this chart, there's a lot of different religions going from gray to black. The black on the left is probably the most conservative denomination. It's white, evangelical, Protestant. And you could probably lump in the white mainline and the black Protestant all together. But you see, that's shrinking. With each generation, there's fewer and fewer of those. Are we seeing that same kind of trend in the Lord's Church? I'm sorry to say, I think I do. So there's an environment that you might have to think about shepherding. And we think about this statistically, but really, every one of those numbers, by the way, a survey of 5,000 people and was published in 2021, so fairly recent. That really represents individual choices, doesn't it? That individual people have made in their lives, whatever it is. Here's some challenges. I did a little research, and then I added and organized and combined. And this is my list. Are you ready? I'm going to go fast. Some of these might not even make any sense. Some of them are so new, I think that we have to invent words to describe them because we can't quite get our arms around them. But let's just go with me and see if you recognize some of these things. Religious and philosophical challenges. Well, first of all, nobody knows the Bible. Biblical literacy. Do you agree with me on that? I mean, it used to be presidents in the United States could quote things like a house divided against itself. And people wouldn't know where that came from. It wasn't Shakespeare, it turns out. You know. But no, nobody knows that kind of thing. Nobody knows anything about it. In fact, there's hostility toward the Bible. As somehow a patriarch or Western, you know, or, or all the criticism kind of silly, but that's you know. um, lost belief in absolute truth and any kind of exclusivism, especially in religious matters. There are these two extremes, I think, rationalism, which is Anything supernatural, just throw it out the window. That's the premise. We're not going to look at it. We close our minds to anything that has to do with God or supernatural or ghosts or anything. The other extreme is to say, well, really the only real reality in the world is the spiritual experience that I have. So I have an individual, non-rational, I can't explain it. It's just what I've experienced. And that gives me guidance and direction. And then the whole irreligion. And so there has been an accelerated apostasy. And that's leaving the church. But also the acceptance of immorality in the church. You go to any kind of denominations anymore, there's not going to be teaching about marriage and divorce or living together or other abortion or any of those kind of moral issues that's just accepted. Otherwise, they leave. That's kind of the thought. Personal challenges that people face as individuals. There's a fragmentation, a compartmentalization of life. I won't say more of that. I think we Christians deal with that or don't deal with that very well. There's an impatience, a boredom, I need quick gratification, and therefore I don't think very deeply or very long about anything. Much, much less religious topics or Bible study or something. And to help me with that, there are digital distractions from any kind of deep thought, or actually even living my life as it turns out. You know there's a kind of a danger that people live in the, in the internet world and not in reality. The kids are having trouble with socialization because they're not around each other in the flesh. 
Uh, there's deification of individual autonomy and personal inclinations. You ever heard this time? Kind of, it's kind of similar to the next one, the, the loss in the possibility that I might actually change my inclination, but I just am what I am, right? If I think I'm fat, then I'm fat. I'm now, people might say, you're anorexic, right? You're really not, but if I think I'm fat, I'm fat. Or if I need to cut myself to deal with reality, I'll cut myself because other people on the internet are doing it. Or if I'm a girl and think I'm a boy, that must be true. What else could be that? And other people are affirming that in my world, my digital world. So are you all aware of these kind of things in the world? The issues? My reality is just what I think and my own inclinations. And I'm attracted to somebody of the opposite sex. That's just the way it is. And I can't change. I am what I am. That's the world we live in. And you actually... Uh, as a result of that, there is no anchor point to decide what a family should be, what sexuality should be, right? I mean, one structure is as good as any other. Let's get rid of the traditional family, which probably came from a white-dominated Western civilization. No, it didn't. It came from the Garden of Eden, right? There's some sense that, you know, so. Uh, anyway, uh, the uh, societal uh, issues then that come are there's a complexity, there's a pace of change, People are grasping for simple answers, right? It's all a result of poverty, right? It's all a result of slavery, or it's all a result of free enterprise. It's all a result of whatever. You name your favorite enemy, and that's the simple answer. I have an idea in the fallen world, things are just complex. Not because of God, but because of sin. It makes everything hard. There's consumerism. That is, I have this perceived need. You need to give it to me. Government, business, church. I need that. You should be providing it. Right. I have entangled allegiances. I didn't make that up, but I like that phrase. I found that. And that is, I can't figure out the difference between patriotism and my faith in God. God and country, in fact, we say sometimes, right? I mean, after all, patriotism to the United States is commanded in the Bible, isn't it? And democracy is the scriptural way of government, isn't it? <coughs> We are our own nation. We belong to God. And live here and here. From which we are to say from this nation. But we get confused about that. And you know that the Democratic Party is the approved party by God. Right? They're eliminating all the abuse that Hosea and Amos prophesied against. Everybody agrees that. Oh no, it's the Republicans. They're the religious party. They're the sanctioned biblical party. You see what you see the problem here? I'm getting all mixed up about my allegiances. I have one allegiance, and these others are moral. And no artifice of man is going to solve the problems in this world. I just have to tell you that. I'm sorry. I'm on a different sermon. Sorry, Mark, come back. I'm going to help you. I'm sorry, but, but you see what I'm getting at. This is a difficult time, and a result of that, since you have one allegiance, I have another. Somebody else has another. We're all polarized, right? I think this is the answer. No, you think this is the answer. I can't believe you'd vote for that person. I can't believe you'd vote for that person. And so now I'm polarized. And I'm arguing over things that really have nothing to do with the real battle in our life. And there's a distrust of political perceived power structures or any authority generally, really. There's just a distrust. And so that will lead eventually to disorder. This is Marty's prophecy, but we'll just see and probably collapse because of all the other polarizations and lack of authority and that kind of thing. And we'll have chaos. And probably out of that, uh, prefer the dictatorship over something else because we'll at least be able to live peacefully. That's way off, off the sermon. I'm so sorry. Erase what I just said. That's not relevant. But I suspect it will get worse rather than better. Don't you? That's the fallen world we live in. Now, you're, you're an elder in the church. And that's what's going on around. How do you handle that? I, I, I'm not going to skip these, but I was just going to say, you might think these are kind of new, but they're not. I used Romans 1. I thought about 2 Timothy 3, the perilous times. I mean, just describe it. I know it's not as specific as these, you know, $3 words I used up there, but it really describes the world. When people have just elevated themselves over God and try to solve their problems, it just results in, you know, animal-like behavior. 
There it is in the last bullet. And that's where we are. That's where we are. All right, you're an elder. What are you going to do? Enabling the work in the 21st century. First off, rely on God because you are the elder is under Christ, and his, the elder's authority comes from Christ. So everything you teach must be from Christ. Rely on God. Y'all remember he said that. Just a minute. I'm going to skip over that for now. Come back. Okay. Well, I, you know, first thing that occurred to me was this. I think an elder needs to be an expert in all current religious, social, political, moral, psychological national, international issues. Your eyes are like this big. <laughs> Don't agree? When you know the truth, everything else is counterfeit, it becomes obvious. Well, this is what scares me, is I start thinking this way, but y'all are right. I, I think that's just a stupid idea. How can you ever know all that, really? And with the time you have, what's the main thing you need to know is what the truth is and build on that. You see that? Because, and I'll just tell you, when I became an elder, I, I studied those passages on, this is an example, on marriage and divorce. I had them down. I knew the current false doctrine and all that. Now I knew the Do you think any of the cases I had to deal with were exactly dead on the, what I expected to have? Um, um, now, he claimed he had a right to divorce, but they got married. Then he admitted he really didn't, and then so they separated, but they weren't getting along anyway, and she wonders if she has a right. Oh, my, I get so mixed up. You know what I mean? None of those cases were that easy. They weren't straightforward. There's always some twist or turn. And that's just one case. Y'all see what I'm getting at? As an elder, you need to be as expert as you can in what you can study and know it. You just won't be able to know for sure all the situations that what would you do if one of the young people was cutting themselves? You were a shepherd. I don't know a thing about that. It makes no sense to me. Liz is shaking her head saying, it doesn't make any sense to me either. Do you know what's happening? And it makes sense to somebody. And it might need to be addressed as a spiritual issue, right? Somehow we've got to figure that out. Y'all see what I'm getting at. But I don't think we know in advance what the case will be. So I think you start with this. In addition to the word, which I'll get back to you got to know the sheep. What are they wrestling with? Because that's what you have to figure out. It isn't the societal issues and where the government's going to go and what's going to happen in the political world. That's not the issue. It's the individual sheep. Remember, which of the two is the key word? It's the sheep shepherd, not the flock. We're not involved in political change. We're involved in saving and soul, helping children grow up. And I need to know what they're struggling with. And all the things, the precursors to that. Who are they? Where did they come from? What have they been through? What struggles have they had? What influences are dominant in their lives? What examples have they had that they might actually be creating without even knowing? Those are the hard things. And then I think there is this, not only knowledge, but confidence with the truth. And I mentioned the Titus passage because what Paul is telling those elders, the Titus says, pick elders who can do this. They need to just have the skills to be able to talk people out of the doctrines that they believe or their false ideas. They have to. That's Titus 1-9. You want to take a look at that. And apparently in Crete, there was a lot of that. Uh, a lot of difficulty. Moral issues, strange teaching and doctrine, a factious people, those kind of things. I'm going to suggest another idea. I think this is essential and it's implied in the qualifications and my life experiences has confirmed this belief for me. And that is, I don't think you're selecting a man to be the shepherd. You're selecting a family. You know there's a passage in 1 Timothy 3 that talks about the women. or that's, There's no Greek word for wives, but clearly the wives of deacons and probably elders too. They have qualifications. And I will tell you, as a shepherd, I don't know how I would have, I wouldn't have been able to do the, the, some of the things I was called on to do without my wife. You know, we talked about diversity and inclusion. Do you understand that there are no young people in the eldership? Are you okay with that? They're not represented, right? How can their voice be heard? There are no women in the eldership. How can their voice be heard? Well, I'll tell you one way. How? The wives of the elders. And I don't know how many times Mary would say, you're missing the point. 
And her emotional antennae, which were made more sensitive than knuckle that Marty's were, would sense things that I never I never would have thought of. And, and she was right. She was right. It was some it was information I, I didn't I mean, I just needed. And I'm meeting with women, hearing their problems and understanding, sympathizing, those kind of things. And she did much of the counseling, of course, too, with regard to wives and mothers and their difficulties. But I'll go further than that. You know that the qualifications list children and the fact that they are faithful. Now, you could translate that believing. There's just the one Greek word for either of those. And they are, they're in submission with all reverence. What would that family look like? Yes, no, young people are representing the eldership, but I wonder if young people are, would normally be representing the elder's family if he has to have believing children in a well-managed household. Could those children be an advantage to him in understanding why people cut themselves or some of the issues that young people, that I don't have a clue about? That's the very place that the elder needs to be able to go. And so that suggests that the young people are not only spiritually strong, and aware and networked through that whichever joint supplies with the rest of the young people that are there. But they have a relationship with their dad that they can go to and say, guess what? And I can show you on Facebook. I know you don't know how to use Facebook, Dad, but here's what's going on. You see? Or I see Facebook so old, every all the old people use that now, right? I should have said something else. Twitter, Snapchat, or whatever. Y'all see what I'm getting at? Now instead of one man bearing this burden, there's a family. And it includes a wife who's, who's faithful and understands the challenges and children who are networked in and are spiritual and respect their dad and understand the work they're doing as a family. I think that's the way you go through generations as elders doing sheep <coughs> children. And then, of course, there's all the proactive, preventive, healing, feeding, protecting, rescuing, that takes up most of the time, represents most of the stress, and is not seen most of the time by everybody who watches and judges sometimes. Now, back to number one. I think you could have a lot of these things. Maybe you could, but I think you could have a good Bible knowledge. You could be aware of issues. You could have pretty good kids and a good marriage and all that. But if inside your own heart, you don't have it, faith and personal integrity. I think that's the foundation of everything. I do teach some leadership classes, or I did, and I'm retired now, but I uh, did for 10 years at Georgia Tech. One of the common themes in looking at corporate or technical leadership is the leader can be extremely talented, charismatic, innovative, a lot brilliant, you know, as a light bulb and all of that, but they can't trust them. They're no leader. And they'll actually do harm in the organization. What begins as an elder's preparation, the skills, I, what did I choose as the final word there? Enablers. <laughs> is his own personal faith and integrity. And I think about the, the tricky job Paul had given Timothy there in Ephesus, where he left him there. I don't know why Paul left. Maybe it's just such a tough problem. He said, Timothy, you deal with this. I don't know. He went on to Macedonia for Timothy. But he says, I left you there. Uh, and to charge certain men not to teach uh, other doctrines. But he goes on right away in that first letter in the first few verses to say, but the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart, a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. And I'm ending because the title is What Really Equips a Man to Be a Shepherd in the 21st Century? And if I had to say one thing, it would be that. A genuine faith. I think that's true in parenting, I think it's true in marriages, I think it's true in any Christian relationship. And that is, if you are striving your hardest to keep your love strong and your genuine faith and your life pure, you can make a lot of mistakes and people understand, no, I still trust that. You, you agree with that? A parent that's loving all the time and then they mess up once or twice, the kids will get over that because they see the genuine heart in that parent. That's true, though. It's the character. I think that's the most important piece of equipment, I don't know, qualification, whatever you want to call it. And, I, and that's what y'all kept trying to get me to talk about the very first of the lesson, but that's what I'm going to end with. And that is the man's purity of heart. Invitation time? Okay. So there we are. Oh, I have one other point. So 
Sorry, it's not quite. I'm so sorry. I knew this would happen. Um, okay. How many people were convinced that sheep shepherding is the primary work that elders are supposed to do? No, some of you are not quite with right. Let's just say everybody. Knows. If that's true, if that's the primary work of an elder, when we read those passages that say, submit to those who have the rule over you, what does that look like? If sheep shepherding is the primary thing, you don't even have to agree it's the primary thing. You just think it's just important thing to do. What would submission look like? If a person, if an elder is doing sheep shepherding on you, what would that sheep shepherding look like? I think that's the simple answer, isn't it? I come to you and say, I don't think you're treating your wife correctly. You said some things in public that I think, she, you know, I could tell she's kind of. You need to apologize to that. You need to fix that. What would submission look like in that? You <laughs> just, what she said, take his advice. Right? Okay, so you know what? I, I, I'm just taking people out of it. Your, your, your problem with your spending and the debt that you're in is going to hurt your faith. I think you need to figure out how to get over this problem of spending and debt, deep and debt. What would submission look like? I hope you're not in debt. Well, but I mean, what would she say? She would say, I'd stay out of the store. Yeah, she would do it. She, she might even turn around and say to me, I have struggled with that. Can you help me? Right? Could you come look over my fight? Let's see what we can do. You're the helper. You're my shepherd. You see that? Isn't that what she, in that kind of, I, mean, I know it's an ideal picture. I go to the young people and said, look, I am seeing stuff on Facebook. The way you dress, the things that you're engaged in, I think, I don't know if that's what you do all the time, but if you do, that's jeopardizing your soul and certainly your influence. And putting it on Facebook doubles the harm that's done even to other Christians. So I go to this young person, I better pick a blank. I'm embarrassing people. You see young persons, right? If I do that, what would submission look like? I would listen to the advice. You see that? We don't think of elders working that way. In fact, we like to say, what I do in my own time is my business. I don't need you meddling in my personal life. Right? Do we sometimes feel that way? You're an elder of the church now. Why don't you take care of that? Why do we sometimes feel that way about it? Right, and, and that's why I say, I don't think you get to this point about submission without going through the point about he already knows them, he already has a relationship, they already trust him, they have seen genuine love and faith in him already. So when he does that, they may not even all agree with it, but they certainly listen and they understand he's well in love. Y'all see that? But I do think submission says, you are wiser than me, and you may be seeing something that I need to hear, and I will do my best to submit to them and have them rule over you. Look at that passage in Hebrews 13. And he says he made me do it with joy and not sorrow. And joy reminds me of the 99 and the one that comes back and it's a kind of an individual thing. It's about sheep shepherding. Please come back. The joy I have is not that the church is big and growing and the parking lot's paved. It's that I have rescued a soul as a shepherd. Don't you see that's the joy that he's talking about in Hebrews 13? Okay, that took a long time. I forgot to put that in there. But you know, you'll... There it is. Those are the verses to take a look at. Uh, verse the fourth that, Hebrews thirteen. They watch and they have usual. That's one. Uh, that's one. Okay. That's that's the lesson. But I just want to say this. I think I've kind of had in my own reaction. I've sensed it in others. Marty, you're kind of presenting a pretty intrusive picture of elders, right? They're up in everybody's business. I don't know that they should be that person. I'm not really ready. To have somebody pushing me around, telling me what to do, talking about my debts, right? Talking about my marriage situation, talking about my Facebook. That's my business. Stay out of my life in those areas. I'll come to church if you want. Y'all, I'm not saying anybody would say that out loud, but you know, you start to get that feeling. You know what I mean? That part of my life is like my own business, not yours. 
But I wonder, and somebody said this before, the elders are shepherding until what? The chief shepherd. And I wonder if there's not, in that period of time, a little bit of a picture of what maybe submitting to Christ ought to look like. Christ didn't deal with Facebook during the Sermon on the Mount. Y'all understand that. But he put down some principles that mature Christians can't help you deal with that. Between them. And I wonder if our reluctance, our aversion, our independence, our protection of our own personal rights in the face of spiritual guidance might not be a small shadow of our willingness to submit to the chief shepherd. Is that possible? Absolutely. I want to go to the most mature person I can. Now, that's not Jesus, but if they're imitating Christ, I need to look at him. I need to listen to him. And that's what the qualifications of the elders are kind of about. They're trustworthy men. And that may be a reflection of my willingness, eagerness, to submit to the chief shepherd. Y'all see that? So I think we should at least have a warning like the law if we're re reacting to this kind of private interference in our lives that I think the Bible is painting for us in the picture of New Testament members. So here is this about Jesus. When he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. That's the big life change. Is in the same way we've talked about in the teeny sense about habits and money and Facebook and other No, in the larger sense, we need to submit to the shepherd. We may not be willing to do that, but he offers such great blessing. The forgiveness of our sins and the hope and meaning in life far beyond the confusion and the change and evil and wickedness in the world here. An offer of an escape to the eternal kingdom. If we're willing to just follow his loving leadership, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. If you need to do something in a public way or a private way that you don't need to tell everybody, we can make changes tonight. All of us, as we sing this 